Good morning, Journey, and happy Sabbath. Welcome to another edition of Sabbath School, where uh, Jesus and I are going to talk about the lesson and um, have an interesting time uh, with it as well, as well, especially this lesson uh, for this week, uh, where it is talking about the sin of pride. Um, and then I want to, let's start with a word of prayer, and then let's just go ahead and get on into it. Um, Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for the Sabbath day. Thank you for the opportunity to break open your word and talk together. Thank you for giving us minds to reason, hearts to feel, and thank you for giving us the example of, your, of Jesus Christ so that we know who you are. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, man. First things first. Uh, we got to talk about this joke at the beginning of the Sabbath school lesson. Yeah. Um, for those of you who might not have opened up your Sabbath school lesson, or um, I know that's none of my people journey because you all read your Sabbath school lessons dil diligently and studiously. Um, the story goes like this. After a minister had preached a sermon, searching sermon on pride, a woman who had heard the sermon waited for him and told him that she was in much distress of mind so, and that she would like to confess a great sin. The minister asked her what the sin was. She answered, the sin of pride, for I sat for an hour before my mirror some days ago, admiring my beauty. Oh, responded the minister, that was not a sin of pride. That was a sin of imagination. Mm. I'll be bluntly honest. Um, I didn't catch the punchline at first. Uh, I was like, wait, what? Like, well, why is imagination a sin, right? And then I talked to my wife about it. And then she told me the punchline and I went, oh, hmm. oh. Um, also, why is imagination a sin? Um, <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> first off, as, as my wife has pointed out, who's there in the background, um, why is imagination a sin? Um, two, one. And two, um, I think we need to take a, just a, a moment to talk about this. Um, first off, um, these Sabbath school lessons have had a tendency to be very uh, androcentric or male-centered, and a lot of times seems to be talking from the male perspective. Um, second, there is a lot of erasure uh, that goes on through the Sabbath school lessons, uh, specifically the erasure of women um, from the text, from human experience, etc. Except for here, um, where a woman is the butt of the joke right? And the pastor's telling her, oh, well, you're not prideful, you're just ugly. Um, I don't know what you think, Jesus, but um, that's a problem. And I think it's a problem on, on two counts. One, it came from Signs of the Times. It actually came from an encyclopedia of 7,700 illustrations from Signs of the Times. So it was used in Adventist uh, literature in the past. Second, that the uh, people writing the Sabbath school lesson fit, thought that it was good and appropriate to put a joke like this, a joke like this in the Sabbath school lesson. And not to mention the fact that it actually very barely ties in with the lesson at all, right? Right. right. Oh, well, in, they say pride in the joke and there, or in the illustration, I don't even want to stop calling it a joke, pride in the illustration, the, sir, the sir, Sabbath school lesson is about pride. So, like, it's fine, right? Yeah. We can be better than this. I mean, I don't know how else, how else to put it, because this is, this is punching down. Um, this is a joke at the expense of women who have been marginalized and oppressed, not only in society, but in our church as well. And I think that what we have to do is we have to, every time we encounter something like this, and so those of you who are watching, I think it's important um, that anytime we encounter a joke like this, um, we have to go, okay, why is that funny? Explain it to me, explain to me in detail why you think this joke is funny. Um, because the same thing goes with racism, it goes with misogyny, it goes with homophobia. Once you have to explain it, you realize, oh wait, 
what I'm actually doing is I'm tying into stereotypes. And what I'm actually doing is I'm trying to generate a laugh at someone's expense. Hmm. And some could say I'm taking it too seriously. Some kids could say I am, uh, you know, no fun or being, not having a sense of humor. But one of the most powerful things that I've heard is this. Men are afraid that women will laugh at them. Women are afraid men will kill them. Margaret Atwood. I, uh, a quote by uh, Margaret Atwood. Um, and we have to take that seriously. That in a world where violence against women is prominent and widespread, mm -hmm. and in a world where women are not treated equally as men, all, all across the board, even, in, even especially in our denomination, um, this is not okay, and this is not funny. Um, and it doesn't even, it doesn't even tie into the lesson. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Um, we can do better than this and we should. Um, in fact, I, I'm probably going to write an email, uh, to them about this, um, and explain why this is not okay. Mm -hmm. Um, this is not what I want. And I don't think God wants Journey to be. Mm, that's good. Because Journey is supposed to be, I want Journey and God, I think I keep saying I, but I believe God wants Journey and our churches to be safe spaces for people and sanctuaries for people. Um, places where they can go without fear and they can worship God without worrying about the way that the world treats them. And all this is doing is just tying into how the world treats women and how the world has taught us to treat women. Uh, despite what Jesus, how Jesus hand, deals with women, how Jesus interacts with women in the gospels. And despite the fact that women were prominent in the early church and leaders in the early church. And it wasn't until the rise of Christian fundamentalism were an important part of ministry in Christianity. Um, I was gonna about to say sorry for going on about this, but I'm actually not uh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> you know, um, we 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 got to get past this, and we got we got to move beyond this. Um, mm -hmm. See, and and honestly, if they had gender shifted it, um, if you're punching up instead of punching down, it's not optimal, right? It's a little bit better, but it's still not optimal. I would even say like, especially in our religious um, literature, why punch at all, whether up or down? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like for the Sabbath school lesson to work, it absolutely did not need this. Right. They could have, they could have just, they could have just started with ever since sin was born in the heart of a mighty angel and they could have just moved on and it would have been fine. Um, and the worst part is this, is that I actually think that the conversation on pride, especially spiritual pride, is an important conversation to have, right? I think it's a conversation we as a church need to have because especially, with, especially within Seventh-day Adventism, now it's, it's, it's honestly not that much different than the rest of Christianity, but since this is our context, here we are. Um, spiritual pride is an issue. It is a problem in our churches. Absolutely, right? Um, when it comes in the forms of self-righteousness and it comes in the forms of being judgmental um, of others. Um, like Jesus says, you know, looking at the speck in their eyes when you've got the plank in yours, mm -hmm. you know, um, and thinking that we've got it together and we have it all figured out. And we um, are essentially the, work the workers of our own salvation when it's actually Christ who is our salvation and Christ who is our righteousness, right? Um, so I think that this is actually an important topic to talk about, but I know a lot of people that if they had read that first, that's it. Done. The rest of the lesson doesn't even matter. They won't even get there. Um, and so, and there goes any chance of any impact you might have because you decided to, you thought it was funny or you thought it was, you know, cute. Um, 
And uh, again, if any of you want to talk about this and dialogue about this further, um, by all means, in the description of the uh, Sabbath School, we're going to have a, a jot form for you that you can fill out and you can con you know, get into contact directly with me um, so we can have a, a further conversation about this. If you'd like more clarification and more uh, discussion about this, uh, this issue in particular, but everything else we talk about today, too. Um, all right. So uh, anything else you want to add to that, Jesus? Um, no, just, um, you got me thinking, um, uh, with the self-righteousness and the pride, um, concept, like, where is that even rooted? Like, where does it even stem from? And I know the lesson is talking about sin and stuff, but, um, sorry about that. Um, I'm like, cause I, I would, I asked myself, oh, did, did it happen in the early Christian church? My first answer was no, but I think it's yes. I think it did happen in the early Christian church too. With this idea that I'm, I'm better than you, or this is what Jesus taught, and you're not doing what Jesus taught. And so, like, I don't know. Like, how do we deal with that? Well, look at the disciples. I mean, even the disciples, even the very first followers of Jesus, they were constantly competing as to who was the greatest who Jesus yeah. loved the most, um, right? Yeah. It's not, I don't even think it's a, it's a Christian thing. I think it, it's gotten into Christianity because pride is a human thing. It's, it's, it's just an in, inherent temptation that we all have, period, regardless of who we are, what systems, what cultures, what times, I think it's just part of the human condition, right? Mm. And maybe it stems from the, the need for affirmation or the need for, you know, um, attention or love maybe it comes from that. Maybe, maybe it just comes from needing to see yourself as important or worthwhile. Maybe it comes from low self image. Um, I don't think it's necessarily clear exactly where it comes from, but I think that it's something that's existed even before Jesus uh, came to earth and Jesus just had to deal with it. I mean, like the text says, God is dealing with it with Israel throughout the Hebrew scriptures. Yeah. Right. And pride and pride is the one that keeps coming up time and time again. I mean, we go back to the tower of Babel and what was the whole thing with the tower of Babel? We had a group of people who say, Hey, we're going to build a tower so high we can reach God with it. And there might, there might be this underlying, like, and if we can do that, what else can we do? Maybe there's this underlying, well, if we can reach God, maybe we could become gods ourselves. Yeah. Right. If we have the power to do this, maybe we are more powerful than God. Yeah. Um, and so now as far as our conventional Christian understanding is, is that pride started uh before the world even began and, and started in the heart of uh, the being that we often call lucifer um and that you know kind of fomented and fermented and uh rotted there and became this rebellion that led to uh lucifer becoming the accuser of satan and being cast down to earth and that whole thing um but just speaking on the human side of things. So I think that's the thing we should speak to the most, honestly, because yeah. the rest of it is metaphysical speculation and theological speculation. And what we can deal with is what we do know from human experience, because not only do we have a lot of information about it, but it's also our lived experience, right? right. So we know that pride exists. And we know that whenever, and honestly, I think it doesn't even matter what religious system we're talking about here, is that spiritual pride uh, becomes it, it, it's because pride exists therefore spiritual pride will exist too um, and where do we see it most often I often see it in the people who say things about themselves like I actually will have members I kid you not be like oh I'm just too humble or I'm, I'm very humble and I'm like mm, if you have to say you are odds are good yeah. not Oh, well, my problem is I give too much, or my problem is I care too much. Mm, really? Really? The member doesn't protest too much. Yeah. Um, or, oh, you know, so-and-so is a good person, but and I'm like, mm, but no. Yeah. 
point, if you have to qualify it, if you have to stay overstate it, if you have to, if you have to state it at all, maybe right. it's something that you ascribed, uh, that you ascribed or something that you desire or something that you are, are hoping to attain. I don't think it might be necessarily who you are, right? Because some of that, I think it just goes without saying. Like, if you are this thing, you just are. Yeah. Um, maybe that has to, maybe that taps into pride, you know? Um, I don't know, I like, I like this idea, especially when we talked about negative emotions back a while ago, I think in 2019 even, or beginning of 2020, yeah. I think beginning of 2020, uh, before the pandemic. Um, this idea that um, a lot of these emotions, a lot of these feelings are actually secondary feelings. Right. So like if we're angry, it's not necessarily that we're just angry. There's mm -hmm. often an underlying emotion um, beneath it that then fuels the secondary emotion that is anger. Um, and I wonder if perhaps pride could be like I was alluding to earlier, pride might be a similar thing where um, pride is actually a kind of a secondary thing and it, and it actually uh, the underlying issues are perhaps low self-image, low self-worth, um, needs and desires for affirmation and attention, those sort of things. Or just selfishness, maybe it's just selfishness. Um, yeah. I mean, we're all prone to that uh, on the whole. I, I, I can think of very few truly selfless people, right? Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. And so, yeah, and so like, like we were saying, like, I think that this is a good thing uh, to talk about here, that we have to be careful about pride and self-exaltation, because uh, I like that how scripture will say like a haughty spirit before a fall, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. is that oftentimes when we, when we give into that too much, we, we set ourselves up for failure, and we set ourselves up for problems. Yeah, and, and what I find interesting um, is this direct correlation between pride and uh, judgment, um, which we'll talk about right now. Um, we're uh, talking about Isaiah 13, um, but that, you know, we're talking, we're, we're talking about God there, but what about the direct correlation between human pride and human judgment? Mm. Um, you know, because I feel like when you, like for most people, I say most people, it, it, they don't mean it with any harm, like their their judgment, you know. Some people are like, hey. <laughs> well, and you know, why I'm making that face, right? Because I I, I believe that uh, Miss Cassandra probably taught you, or, you know, my wife taught 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 you in, in when talking about rhetoric and talking about writing. Um, intention to some degree is irrelevant. Like mm. whether or not, like, look, I didn't intend to A B C, but guess what? Yeah. It happened. So yeah, I don't, I don't think some of these church members are intending to harm with their judgment. No, I think some are. Yeah. Um, maybe, the, maybe not all though, right? But at the end of the day, if the person is still harmed by the judgment, it doesn't matter what they intended. It yeah. doesn't make it better, <laughs> right? Oh, well, I, I accidentally hurt you instead of I purposely hurt you. Some, for some reason, we seem to think that that just makes it okay. You know, I, I know people who won't even apologize because it was an accident. Mm. And my whole thing is, look, the person is hurt. Regardless of whether you meant to or not, the person is hurt. For example, with my boys and like they're rough house, right? Because that's, that's what my boys do. They rough house, right? And Ben would like knock JJ down and JJ would start crying. And we go, Ben, dude, what's up? And Ben would be like, it was an accident. It was an accident. And we're like, okay. Or it wasn't my fault. I didn't do right. I was like, okay. Why don't you help your brother up first? Why don't you right. see if he's okay? You know, before we even talk about this, like, right? It doesn't matter whether you meant to or not. He's still hurt. What are you mm. going to do about that? That's good. Yeah. Right? Um, and that's what I think. Of the, like, and I can't tell you, man, how many stories of people who came to church and then never came back because of the judgment that they faced from people in the church. Right. And yeah, it honestly and, and doesn't I, They're gone. I say that because the other day um, I had a conversation with, with, a, with a friend of mine um, 
he's also a Christian. I'm not, I forgot what, uh, uh, what is it called? Um, denomination? I forgot what denomination he was, yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we used to do ministry on, in high school together, like, um, this is in a public high school, so we used to do ministry together, which is super interesting dynamic that we had. Um, and I caught up with him the other day. And he was, t- we were talking about that topic of like judgment, right, on other people, right? And he was telling me how, um, you know, his, his, his brother is like, uh, he drinks a lot and things like this, how his sister does this and how his, you know, family does this or that. And um, he knows my group of friends. I have a very close group of friends. Um, and I mean, for the most part, you know, they smoke, they drink, um, you know, they don't really, um, uh, they don't, and that's just what they do, you know, and, I, and those are like my close group of friends, and um, he was asking me like, hey, like, what do you, you know, like, do you ever talk to him about anything or this and that, and I'm like, no, <laughs> like, my job is to be their friend, like, that's, that's who I am, like, I don't, care to like I do care right but I'm not gonna sit around and be like hey you should maybe you don't do that because of this this or that you know mm-hmm. it's just like yo I'm I'm your friend and if you need me when when you need me like I'm there I got you and so and that, that's kind of what's I don't know if that makes sense but like that's kind of where I was coming from like maybe in the past I would have judged them and been but, like hey. and what does it do I would say the first question I would ask is, well, what does it accomplish? Right? Is you, you, you telling them, oh, well, you're doing X, Y, Z, and you shouldn't be doing these things because blah, 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 blah. Right. Right? What does that actually accomplish? And then I like how Paul in Romans 2, and see, I know they're going through Isaiah, and I know they're trying to draw lessons from Isaiah, and sure, and I see where they're going with the Isaiah 13 thing and, and all that, and sure. But if we're going to talk about pride and we're talking about judgment, right? We should go to Romans 2. Mm. And Paul says, therefore, you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. You say, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is in accordance with truth. Do you imagine, whoever you are, that when you judge those who do such things and yet do them yourselves, you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And then it actually talks about having a hard and penitent, penitent heart. And my, I think my point is that what I've seen is from members who become really judgmental, they actually harden their hearts to grace. They harden their hearts to kindness and, mm-hmm. and mercy and patience. And oftentimes what they do is they rationalize their own misdeeds or because they're not as bad and they dump all of the bitter vitriol on others that are doing things. And oftentimes I've seen people who are judging others for the very same thing they're doing. Yeah, And I think I, this is such a complex word concept to unpack because then you have to bring in like the sanctification process, like, you know, this idea that like yo i i know god i've accepted god into my heart and this concept that i should be changing i'm changing why is that person not changing and am i you know i don't know this might be iffy response but um god didn't love you because you were here god loved you when you're here and that doesn't change like that does not change at all and so, I don't know, like, that's, it's so many different layers to unpack. Right, because we're, we're, we're talking about, like, the idea of accountability versus judgment, and we're talking about uh, this idea of we're supposed to be on this, this, this track of sanctification, and, and the frustration that comes when, yeah, yeah, like you said, you're here, and others are here, and, but what we, and I like how you said it, what we have to keep in mind is God loves both the same. Yeah. And that God's grace is the same for both. That's why I like to use the, the car analogy. Yeah. That yeah. In our lives, like as far as we can go. And at a certain point, our car is going to stop because we just run out of gas or whatever, it breaks down. And then grace carries us the rest of the way. Hmm. 
And when Christ returns, not everyone's going to be in the same place. There'll be a person who quite literally like picked up a Bible like off the street that day or whatever and is like, oh man, this Jesus sounds pretty cool. And I think is like, they're there, right? Um, I think that it's interesting. And this is why people reject things like universal salvation so much. Yeah. Because they want the judgment. They want the accountability. Why? Because they want to feel vindicated. That I lived my life correctly. I did the things correctly. They did not. So therefore I should be rewarded. They should be punished. And then therefore I get vindication for the way I lived my life. And, and, and I don't, and I think this is a, a good a way for us to um, lean into Isaiah 13. I don't blame them because the language they're referring to, we find it here in Isaiah 13, this judgmental yeah. language, this, this need yeah. for God's judgment, the need for God's wrath. And like you're saying, I don't, it's not necessary. Like I, I don't, you know, think it's necessary, this, this need for uh, God's complete wrath over humanity. Um, and so maybe we can jump into Isaiah 13 and, and see where that language comes from. Yeah, let's read uh, Isaiah 13. And then I want you to ask me a couple of questions, especially based off of what uh, your reading of the, how the Sabbath school lesson dealt with it. Um, yeah. Okay. This morning, we're going to, we're going to fight the quarterly a little bit. Um, the Oracle concerning Babylon that Isaiah son of Amos saw on a bare hill, raise a signal, cry aloud to them, wave the hand for them to enter the gates of the nobles. I myself have commanded my consecrated ones, have summoned my warriors, my proudly exulting ones, to execute my anger. Listen, a tumult on the mountains as of a great multitude. Listen, an uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathering together. The Lord of hosts is mustering an army for battle. They come from a distant land, from the end of the heavens. The Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole earth. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will be feeble and every human heart will melt. They will be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. See, the day of the Lord comes cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the earth a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pride of the arrogant and lay low the insolence of tyrants. I will make mortals more rare than fine gold and humans than the gold of Ophir. Um, now that's a, a threat of eradication there just so that we're clear on that. Mm -hmm. Um, therefore, I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Like a hunted gazelle, or like sheep with no one to gather them, all will turn to their own people and will flee to their own lands. Whoever is found will be thrust through, and whoever is caught will fall by the sword. Their infants will be dashed to pieces before their eyes, their houses will be plundered, and their wives ravished. See, I am stirring up the Medes against them, who have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. Their bows will slaughter the young men and will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pride of the Chaldeans, will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. Arabs will not pitch their tents there. Shepherds will not make their flocks lie down there. But wild animals will lie down there and its houses will be full of howling creatures. Their ostriches will live and their goat demons will dance. Hyenas will cry in ta its towers and jackals in the pleasant places. Its time is close at hand and its days will not be prolonged. All right, can we just take a quick moment to talk about how extra the their goat demons will dance is? <laughs> like, we're, I mean, there is pronouncing condemnation and judgment and there is, I will tear down your buildings and make them a place where goat demons dance. I've got to remember that for some, some of the gaming and stuff. I, I got to remember that one. Like, I will make your house a place where goat demons dance. Like, I mean, is, is it just me or is it, is it a little a little intense? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean, um, one of the things that uh, the lesson does is um, it s starts to ask us, like, notice how strong the language is. Um, why does a loving God do these things or allow these things to happen? Certainly some innocent people will suffer as well, wouldn't they? How do we understand this action by God? And then, it, and then the, 
lesson goes on to tell us what we should do with this passage. It says, uh, what, we, what should these texts and all the texts in the Bible that talk about God's anger and wrath against sin and evil tell us about the uh, nature of sin and evil? Isn't the mere fact that a God of love would respond this way enough evidence to show us just how bad sin is? And here is the solution that they give. We have to remember that this is Jesus speaking these warnings through Isaiah. The same Jesus who forgave, healed, pled with, and admonished sinners to repent. In your own mind, how do you come to understand this aspect of a loving God's character? Ask yourself this question as well. Could not this wrath uh, um, actually stem from his love? If so, how so? Or look at it from another perspective, that of the cross, where Jesus himself, bearing the sins of the world, suffered worse than anyone else ever has suffered, even those innocents who suffered because of the sins of the nation. How does the suffering of Christ on the cross help answer these difficult questions? So I understand, I get it, what they're saying. But when I first read this, and I, and I told you this, I feel like these answers are a cop-out. You cannot just pace Jesus in front of every difficult question you ask. Um, and especially not in this context, in, in, in the Hebrew context, when, when at the time they didn't know Jesus, they knew Yahweh the God of Exodus, the God who freed them, the God who, who comforted them and, and, and did everything. And, and, and right, I know this is not talking about Israel. I know it's talking about Israel's oppressors, but still to, to talk about um, God in this fashion and to say, oh, it's fine because Jesus later died on the cross. That just doesn't um, make sense to me. So I wanna question the God of Israel and I wanna question Yahweh and be like, yo, what do you mean? And, and this happens all the time. I mean, just look at the book of Joshua. <laughs> you know? like a lot of time in that. And, and so um, it, I like to refer to it as, as the, the other. What does, what does the other have to say in this? What, what does um, right, Babylon have to say against Yahweh? The, those innocent ch uh, children, those innocent uh, uh, wives, or and just innocent people have to say about hey I, I i didn't say i agreed with babylon i don't agree with what we're doing either but why do i have to you know why do i have to suffer god's wrath and um i don't know i i know yeah i'll stop right there we have to be incredibly careful when we do theodicy because mm -hmm. you mentioned before this is what is going on here. There is, a, there is a certain sense of theodicy that is happening here. Now, for those who don't know, theodicy is this conversation of the presence of evil and suffering alongside the presence of the existence of an all-loving, all-powerful God. Made famous by the philosopher David Hume, uh, who said, um, talked about the problem of evil, and if God is both able and willing to solve the problem of evil, then why does evil still exist? And to a certain extent, suffering uh, from that as well. We have to be very careful, and I'm just going to be bluntly honest, I do not, I think that that's a charitable way of putting it even, where it's a cop-out, um, because we have to be really careful, because this same language, um, and especially the, could not his wrath actually stem from his love, we have to be really careful with that, because that very easily falls into abuser language. Mm -hmm. I hurt you because I just love you so much, and you make me so angry, or I was just so jealous because I love you so much. Yeah. And, and dude, I, I have to stop you right there. Um, because this is okay. What you're saying is okay. In, um, in, uh, my, I don't know, in immigrant, uh, families, like, you know, um, for example, like just in the Mexican culture, this is like everything that we're reading is completely 100% okay. Uh, for, for, um, to have that toxic love. Of, of, hey, like, I'm hurting you because, like, I love you, you know? And and so that that's what messes me up, right? Because even, right, um, like, just opening up a little bit, like, I, I, I can see this within my own household. And I can see, like, um, like I could, I could imagine, like, my dad reading this and agreeing, right? And, and I, I feel like I've even been taught this in church, like, hey, this is all stemming from God's love. And I'm like, yo, the generational impact that this has. And you know, I'm grateful that, that I, can, I can see the difference. 
and be like, no, like I, I refuse to uh, love my significant other the way that this is telling me to love. Mm. But other people can't, you know, unless they wrestle with this, they don't, they don't see it. And they pass it on to their children. They pass it on, they pass it on. And, and they like, where does it stop? Like, where does it stop this abusive love? And so I just had to cut you off to say that. <laughs> no, that's, that's really powerful, man. Um, and you're absolutely right. Um, especially if, if you come from a background of abuse or being abused. Um, you basically have to, because the problem is that these are cycles and these are human cycles. These ideas of violence and abuse are perpetuated generation to generation because the older generation will abuse the younger generation and then we'll teach them that it's okay to treat people this way. And then it'll just, it can perpetuate until someone says like, like you are, someone says, no, I will not perpetuate this cycle. I will not, I will not do this. I will not take part in this. Um, and yeah, man, I mean, this is, this is heavy. I know. Um, but we have like one of the one of the sins of Christianity, one of them has uh, perpetuated in its existence, has been using scripture to tell people, primarily women, um, to stay in abusive relationships. Yeah. Um, even even voices like Doug Batchelor has has done that, um, and other other uh, independent ministries have done things uh, essentially encouraging or urging women to stay in relationships, even if they're abusive. Yeah. And, and what they're trying to do here, uh, I also don't like how they're trying to play the suffering Olympics and they're trying to say, oh, well, Jesus suffered so much more than the rest of us. So our suffering doesn't really matter. And I'm like, no, no, because I don't think, I don't think Jesus himself would agree with that statement. I don't, I don't think Jesus would go, well, I suffered on the cross for your sins. So I, I know that your child got killed for no reason, but you just have to suck it up and get over it mm. because I suffered more. Mm. I, I don't see Jesus ever saying something like that. And this is the problem, right? Because what we were talking about before is what they're trying to do is they're trying to read the Hebrew scriptures through the lens of Christ which I, I think as Christians is something we should do. Right. However, they're going about it backwards. Yeah. They're saying, oh, well, we're going to use, because Christ was there. And when Christ says, when you've seen me, you've seen the father, all of this stuff is now more okay because Jesus was saying these things too. Mm. But I'm going to ask a question to them. Is it possible that now that we have Jesus, we have the full revelation of God's character and God's love and God's mercy and God's grace and God's forgiveness for everyone, for all people, regardless of who they are, what they've done, etc. Is it possible then we go back into these scriptures and we critique it and hold it, hold it accountable because of Christ? Mm-hmm. Because this language that's being used here in Isaiah 13, Jesus would not use. Right. There's, there's, in, in the Gospels, this is not language that Jesus would partake in. Um, so I wonder if, for example, when Jesus in his apocalypse, when Jesus talks about the suffering that humanity will go through, it's not that God is creating the suffering is that human beings are actually creating the suffering because human beings are horrible to each other. Mm. And this is what human beings are going to do to human beings before Jesus comes. Mm. I wonder if here in Isaiah 13, we do the same thing because of the example of Christ. We go back here and go, I don't think God is actually wants this. And I don't think God is actually personally desiring to do these things. Is it possible that God is talking about what humanity is capable of doing to humanity and what hu human beings do and have done and will do to each other, you know, because of their pride and because of their brokenness and, and sinfulness, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is, and honestly, like you were saying, man, like, and I think we should tap into 
we have to be careful when we engage in the conversation on suffering and on talking about suffering. Right. Um, there's now when it comes to theodicy, and I think this is an important time to have like a small conversation on this. And if you want more, by all means, jot form description, hit us up, let us know, we can talk more. Um, there are many different theories of theodicy. There are many different theories about why suffering exists alongside God. Right. And the book of Job is actually an incredibly um, good primer for that conversation. Um, so there are a couple different theories. Uh, Jesus, I hate to give you a pop quiz, <laughs> but uh, what are some of the theories that you've uh, learned about? Dude, I've like, I'm, so I've read uh, Richard Rice's book, Suffering and the Search for Meaning. Mm, good one. Good one. That, that one is a, a really good, like, it's only like, probably like 200 pages and that one goes in depth into all the sufferings i mean all the theodicies in regards to suffering and i keep looking through my notes to see if i can find it mm. but i cannot so uh you have um just off top let me try to remember um there's like a a, a suffering that like it's supposed to make you stronger all right, yeah, so we'll break down the, like, the, uh, uh, let's say the top three, yeah, because there's, there's more, and there's more, like, sub delineations of different ones, so what you're talking about is what many people call um, soul-making theodicy. Soul-making, yeah. What doesn't kill us makes us stronger, um, and the suffering we go through actually tempers us like steel, and actually will um, make us better people at the end of the day. And honestly, um, this one is one I think a lot of people ascribe to, especially Rick Warren when he did the Purpose Driven Life. Um, a lot of a lot of Christians, a lot of people will tap into this. Even non Christians will tap into this idea that the suffering we go through makes us stronger, and so that's why you know it's a in a weird way a good thing because it makes us better. Um, but then we have to be really careful because then a lot of people go, "Oh, well, God allowed us to suffer." so we could get better. And honestly, I think that a very good and solid important critique of that is that that's sadistic. It would almost be like me like slapping my kid because I'm gonna toughen him up. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, well, I'm gonna inflict pain on you so that you become more resistant to pain. And so it actually quote, helps you later on. Yeah. And it's like, no, that's, that's, that's abusive, that's sadistic, that's gross, right? So we have to be really careful when we use a soul-making theodicy because um, yeah, I, I think it gets overused and abused a lot. I have a couple of other ones here that I found. Uh, we have one that's called like the perfect plan theodicy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This idea that uh, complete confidence is fulfillment of God's purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, we already touched a little bit on soul-making theodicy. Um, uh, they're the whole free will thing. I believe that's also one form of dealing with suffering. Yeah, we'll t we'll tap into that one when we when we do the the final kind of take on that because 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 I tap into that one a bit. There's the kind of this idea of a cosmic conflict theodicy. So I'm assuming Great controversy. Controversy. Um, the question was um, I thought that there was something. This idea that God takes a risk, and again, I think that might be the whole idea of free will again, like the risk that God takes. Mm -hmm. um, There's a couple more. Um, there, I'm not, oh, sorry. Also, finite God theodicy that like um, God does not always get God's way. So, uh, yeah, pro and it's also called process theodicy or process theology, in which God isn't actually able to that God can only persuade or God can only do certain things, but God can't do what God would fully want to do at this point um, to, to, to rid the world of suffering and evil. Uh, yeah. And yeah, people get really squidgy with that one too, right? Mm -hmm. Because then it takes away the omnipotence of God and it takes away some of the classic attributes of God. Um, there's the karmic view of it, that we reap what we sow and that what we do comes back to us. So if we put good out there, good comes back. If we put bad out there, bad comes back. And, and in fact, this ties into what's called the Deuteronomistic worldview, which is actually what the book of Job is trying to deconstruct. Because the whole Deuteronomistic worldview is the idea of, well, if you're prospering, 
it's because God has blessed you. Mm-hmm. And if you're suffering, it's because God has cursed you. The reason why is because you've done something right or wrong. Yeah. And your life and your, your actions and stuff will determine whether God's blessing you or cursing you. And it's shown through your prosperity or your suffering. Yeah. Um, and Job, more than anything, less than trying to ascribe to a certain theodicy, Job is mostly trying to deconstruct Deuteronomistic worldview. Um, so there's the karmic view. Then there's mystery where it's like, well, we don't know. We just don't know. We don't see the full picture. Eventually, maybe God will, will show us why all of these things. We just don't know in the meanwhile. Which can kind of tap into the perfect plan one a little bit, but it's slightly different. It's, it's more or less, oh, God has a plan and everything follows the plan. And more, we don't know. And, you know. Um, so out of these, uh, Jesus, I mean, as you were mentioning earlier, like, is there one that really works? Um, you know, I, I definitely recommend picking up that book, Richard Rice's book. Um, I know when I read it, this is about two years ago, I, I would read, a, a, so each chapter was based on a different theodicy, and I would read it, and I'm like, wait, I agree with that, or I feel that. And then I'll read the next one, I'm like, wait a minute, you know? And I love how Richard Rice ties it together. He says, look, you know, you might, you might not feel, you, not, you might not resonate with a single one, you might resonate with all of them, you might resonate with a couple. And then he leads uh, the readers into something he calls, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, a practical, practical theodicy. This idea that you form your own theodicy based on your personal experience from suffering. Um, and I, that's personally what I lean towards too, because I know that my suffering is, is, is uh, different and it's worthy. And your suffering is also different, unique and worthy. And there's no reason why I should be able to, I should tell you, hey, look, it's this and this. No, your, your suffering is valid. It's a part of your life. It's part of your experience. And the fact that you suffer does not take away meaning from your life. Mm-hmm. If anything, it just adds, adds more to you and to your, your life. So that's what I lean towards too, this idea of creating your own. And I, and I kind of resonate with that. But then at the same time with any of these other theories, my main critique of it would be that it definitely tends to the postmodernist. And, mm-hmm. you know, oh, well, it's your perspectives, man. Like, you know, like, oh, well, it's your suffering. So, you know, however you want to uh, explain it, go ahead. Yeah. But at the same time, it, it, what it does, oh, it, it feels like it almost dodges the main question, though. That's true. The yeah. question isn't, how do I view my suffering? Or how do, I, how do I interpret my suffering? The question is, why am I suffering in the first place? Um, yeah. And there is something, if we believe that God is consistent and God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, if we believe in this God that is all powerful and all loving, that question doesn't go away with that, right? It's still there. It might help us feel better about it, but it doesn't take away the question. And so that would be my main critique of that. Um, uh, all due respect to Dr. Rice. Um, <laughs> but what I would actually say is my, where, I, where I'm at with it, as I, I tend towards the free will thing, that humanity has free will, and for love to exist, free will has to exist. And people exercising free will leads to brokenness and leads to sin and leads to suffering that we inflict it on ourselves because of free will. So I'm, I'm definitely there with that. Also, though, I think that part of the problem is trying to explain evil and suffering in the first place. Yeah. Because you really can't. It doesn't actually make sense. Why, why, what causes someone to do something that's quote evil at the end of the day, at the very core of it, like where is that, like that one, that, that one last step between just thinking about something and doing something right. Mm -hmm. Or wanting to do something doesn't, doesn't quite make sense. I wonder if part of our problem as Christians is that we spend too much time and too much energy trying to explain evil and suffering. When I, and I agree with the idea of a practical theodicy. However, I would take it one step further and say that our practical theodicy should be less talking about evil and suffering and why and saying, what are we going to do about it? Right. And as a church, not, not trying to give an explanation for theodicy, but be the answer for theodicy. Go, look, 
you are suffering and that is not okay. Regardless of why it is happening, we want to help you uh, help alleviate your suffering. Yeah, it goes back to that example you gave of uh, uh, Ben and JJ, right? Like, hey, I, hey, pops, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what happened. He just fell. No, like, okay, he fell. Help him up. And then we can figure it out. And I think that's kind of right. Oh, that's so beautiful. That's a beautiful example because that is our call as, as Christians. We continue to help until we get the explanation from God himself or God's self, not himself, God's self. Until, until God's self comes and is like, hey, like, let's, let's, let's sort this out. Until that happens, we continue to help those that are falling and seek no, seek no response. Just continue to help, 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 help until we can figure this whole, whole, whole thing out. Right. And part of that is letting go of our pride. Yeah. Because our pride is what causes us to stop and go, well, I didn't do this. Yeah. Or why, why, did, why are you even on the floor, you know? Yeah. Why are you on the floor? How'd you get there in the first? Are you drunk? Like, yeah. like what are you doing with yourself? How, what are you doing to better yourself? Right? Yeah. And instead of asking those questions, we just need to help someone. Yeah. yeah. Um, Spoiler, that's, probably, that's tying into my sermon tomorrow as we begin talking about our mission statement and uh, introducing ourselves to a new digital community and what we're about here at Journey. Um, but that's it. I think that's what it should be. And honestly, like, I think the lesson tries, but I think that that's where we should end up, right? Yeah. Is that our pride gets in the way of helping people. Yeah. And our pride gets in the way of God helping us. Yeah. And in order to have those, do those things, we have to let it go. Yeah. And, and, and maybe just to use stronger words, um, our, our pride, and our, I, I guess our pride restricts what God can do through us and the, the impact that we can have on other people. And, right, and because I, God won't force God's self, right? Yeah, yeah, and not, not even that, but not just not to say that God is restricted, but like, I, if I can't see you eye to eye because of what you do or who you are or what you identify as, then I'm limiting the gospel because I, 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 I don't allow myself to extend God's love to you. Right. And yeah, that's, yeah. And the second, and I think the second that we start thinking that we are better or more than others, we're blinding ourselves. And yeah, we're, yeah and you're right. We're not able to see them as people. We see them as other. We see them as projects. We see them as sinners. We see them as losers or failures or mess ups. And you're right. I like that. I like how you said that. I think that that hinders the work of the gospel. Yeah, hinders. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, I think that we got a good thing here. Um, look, do you, do you have any questions? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you, uh, want to talk to us about this? We would love to hear from you. We're going to have in the description of this video, a jot form that you can fill out. Um, and it doesn't even have to be for this. If you want prayer, if you want more Bible study, if you want baptismal study, whatever it is that you need. We can provide for you. Just fill out that form, shoot it over to us, and we'll get back to you on it. Um, Jesus, thank you so much for uh, being part of this discussion today. Thank you for your uh, incredibly insightful contributions to our conversation. And um, all of you, Journey, make sure to remember that God loves you very much. Remember to love each other. And remember that we at Journey SDA love you, and no distance can change that. So we'll see you guys later.